Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. We're going to give you just a moment to hop onto the webinar and we'll go ahead and get started in about one minute. All right, all right. I'd like to take a moment to welcome everybody to today's webinar. My name is Megan Testani. I am the marketing director here at Red Level. I would like to introduce you to my dear friend, Ryan Charnock, who will be presenting today. Hey, Megan. Today, we will be presenting on Microsoft Teams, self-service and lifestyle, life cycle management. Um, this is being hosted by our dear friends over at Horizons Computer Learning Centers. We do have a couple of quick poll questions to kick off things today. So if everybody could take just a couple of seconds and hit the poll, does your organization use Microsoft Teams currently? Give everybody just a couple of seconds to get in there and vote into this poll. They're really cruising. They really are. It looks like a good portion of everybody is using Microsoft Teams currently. Okay, so we have one more polling question for you. Our next question is going to be specifically on if you're using Microsoft Teams, does your organization allow for self-service? Question at hand, isn't it? It is, given today's topic, right? Isn't it? Yeah. No, but Megan, I want it. <laughs> it depends. You have to make sure you know what self-service means and what kind of wild, wild west rodeo you might get involved in. That's true. Just another couple of seconds before we end this poll. We have a good bit of participation so far. And it's looking like... A lot of people really aren't sure if they have. I love that. <laughs> that's really a surprise. I, I think that's just fantastic. Okay, so yeah, lots of not sures, handful of yeses, and a couple of handfuls of nos. That is so insightful, actually. To I might reuse that in future lessons and stuff uh, I got going on. Awesome. Well, Ryan, why don't you take it away for us? Okay, great. Thanks, Megan. And so once again, yeah, thanks New Horizons for hosting us and um, going through, giving us an opportunity to speak to you guys about teams and self-service. This seems to be like one of the most common topics that comes up when in regards to teams. Everybody seems to like really like the tool, but the only reservation they have about it is, should we let people provision their own teams or should that be IT controlled? So that's today's topic. So here we go. So the way we're going to break this down, okay, is we're going to look at, hey, what it is, why, why should you use self-service? We're gonna look at arguments, traditional arguments against it. And then um, I'll show you some features that maybe will change people's mind. All right, so but that's the kind of cool thing is at the end is what I'm curious to know where you are gonna sit in the world of kind of this world of self-service for teams. All right, we'll do demos along the way. So here we go. All right, so if you don't know me, I'm Ryan Charnock from Red Level. And um, I used to be instructor at New Horizons for a real long time, for like 12 years taught um, .NET, SQL, SQL DBA guy, and then, but mostly I was a SharePoint person. Spent a bunch of time with, uh, in the enterprise world as a SharePoint developer and project manager at Chrysler, and been with the, in the consulting field for the last, now four or five years. Okay, I live in the local area of Michigan, and um, I'd love to connect with you on Twitter or on LinkedIn. I got four kids, you can see, and I got pretty active life, and uh, I, do, I do way too much with soccer, says everybody, so but I'm a soccer, soccer coach and have a lot of fun. All right, so here we go. Let's get into this. All right, so um, here we go. So number one, what is, what is self-service? What are we talking about here? So we're really dealing with this idea of allowing end users to provision their own Microsoft team, okay? So without interaction from uh, IT, uh, manager approval, um, anything that requires, that would slow them down, okay? That means they can go to the Teams interface, say create team, put in a name, and they're off and they're running and they have a brand new team created, 
Okay, so that's kind of the idea. And so the traditional things or items that slow that process down are these things what I call friction points. Okay, so friction points usually will slow that creation down. You're like, well, all right, why does that even matter? Well, we'll talk about this in a second. Okay, is number one is like maybe a lot of times you might find a scenario where IT like have to put in, they have to push a button to actually order it or create the team. You want them to do it or um, a request for a team is going to go through a manager review. So emails get launched around or you have to navigate to a special net ordering form to fill it out. Um, or you have to put in like a service now ticket or something like that. And so the all the whole thing about this is it's slowing down the time it takes from the time you say, I need to collaborate. I have this need till when you actually get the team. That's, that's the difference. Where self-service is, I, when I think I need a team, I make the team and it's immediately right there. Okay, so that's kind of what we're dealing with is, is this item. Okay, and so the, the whole, whole kind of question why I think people should use self service is that in a, in a world of a team, you have a different mix of ingredients of members, files, topics, and notes or a series of different meetings. It's very volatile, it's very changing all the time, right? Just like our menu, our food is usually changing pretty rapidly. Right? And our ingredients usually change in and out also, just as a dietary kind of a thing. So a team is having to be able to predict, like you're only gonna need these five teams, I've created these five teams, and these are the only ingredients you get. Mm, it's gonna be great. No, it's usually, it's very dynamic, right? And most organizations feel that collaboration and the, the ability to collaborate with individuals pushes their, you know, their strategic, strategic goals even further. So the idea is let's have a tool that can move at the same speed at which collaboration happens. For example, let's say we have Jim, Jill, Jill, and Jeff. Okay. They're in a staff meeting with 10 other people during the staff meeting. It comes up that, Hey, they need to come up. They need to be, they've been assigned to update a new project dashboard in, Pro, in Power BI. Okay. So Jill is the Power BI for expert. Jeff is the data source guy. And then uh, Jack, Jack is the kind of the overall manager of it all. So they got this new task assignment. They need to work collaboratively together. There's data sources, there's files, there's deadlines, there's time, come, things to come follow up on. There's going to be meetings, there's going to be files, there's going to be notes. So how they need to collaborate and put all this stuff together. Now, if they can't access something within three seconds. That's the rule. Three seconds. If they can't figure out a place to go put all that stuff, they will create one or use the tool they're most familiar with. Email, network shares, or a SharePoint site. And they have their own set of problems, which I don't have time to get into. Okay. But Microsoft Teams really solves a lot of those problems. So we, we don't want to have any friction to inhibit them going, hey, Actually, during the staff meeting, they could have just spun up this team and then started dumping some of those ideas and meetings. So before the staff meeting is even over, they have the next meeting for their little mini project already scheduled, and they already have agendas and things kind of, kind of jamming into that. That right there is the cool awesomeness of teams and what self-service is really all about. No inhibitors to the end users so that the pace of collaboration matches also the speed at which they can provision the tool that they're going to use for that collaboration space. That's cool. I love that. Okay. Let's say we didn't have that. Let's say we didn't have self-service for them. Then they're like, Oh, I got to submit a ticket. Okay. Or I got to put this into review. So now it'd be days or hours before the team actually create gets created. And the thing that was foremost in their mind at that staff meeting has now gone back in their mind. is isn't as, isn't as fresh. And they don't have all those ideas and they have to kind of like, it's actually more cognitive work to then read back into your memory, pull all that stuff and pull it back up, which then it will exhaust them even more. And they're not being as effective with their time. That's kind of cool. Brought you a little science. Okay. So that's really why you should use it. That's what self-service is. Okay. So then the next piece we'll look at is, okay, what are some of the arguments against this thing? Okay. So some of the arguments against this is there's really kind of a three, there's a three couple of different fold. Okay, there's, there's the arguments of um, bad naming conventions and then also teams sprawl. Okay, so let me tackle these guys for you and we'll kind of begin to look at these, these issues. Okay, the first thing we have with naming conventions is we have the option of if you allow teams, team self-service, people will name the teams anything they want. 
and you get imposters, okay? So let's say you have an event in May called Expo, okay? It's, a, it's a, an event that you have for all of your vendors and all your organization, and um, you have a big convention. It's like a one-day show. It's awesome, fantastic. You have booths. It's going to be a fantastic event, okay? So you need to collaborate with all different internal folks to get this event up and running, okay? So then if you allow self-service, if you just search for teams, on Expo, you might find teams with all these different names, Expo 2020, blah, 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 all the way down the line. So which is the real one, right? So which is the true kind of, you know, one that really matters? So Eminem best said it best, says, will the real person please stand up? So at this point, there's a little confusion. We allow self-service, people will name things anything they want, and I don't, in a discovery kind of scenario, I can't figure out which is the true one, okay? So that's, that's interesting. Okay. That's an interesting point. And we'll let's put it right there. Okay. So that's kind of, kind of fun. So the next piece of the puzzle we have is then we also have this idea of organization. Okay. So the other part of the other rebuttal here is now Ryan, if we have all different kinds of names for these teams, when I open up Microsoft teams, they're then like, they're named all different kinds of stuff. I have my teams that for departments that I'm a part of, I have teams for cross-functional teams. I have teams for projects. How do I keep these things all so nice and tidy? Now you guys that love tidy, you love this picture of the, of the, uh, the, the kitchen here. You're just like, Oh, it feels so good to have things organized, labeled, everything in its place and a place in every, in its thing. You just feel really good. So that's another rebuttal is that, I can't keep these, I want to keep these things organized. And if I have, I need to have a naming convention. And if, if I allow the users to do it, they're not going to do really good with the naming convention. So we're going to, we're going to have the IT or the manager provision. So it actually follows a really good naming convention. We have more certainty around the names of these teams, but here is the rebuttal to that. Okay. In Microsoft teams, in the teams interface, you cannot sort the teams by name. You just can't. And traditionally, that's where a naming convention falls into place and really plays its strength. Think about like folders, okay? And in a network share, we traditionally have naming conventions for folders and you sort them so that like all of the P's are together, all the D's are together, all the S's are together. And then if you have another kind of character, that's what this, this means. And so you're gonna kind of organize them, categorize them based on the name and sorting them. But in the team, Microsoft Teams interface, can't sort them. No, no, no. But what you can do is you can position and pin. Position and pin. Positioning means you can just drag the teams around, you can move them where you want, and you can take a particular individual channel and say, pin that baby, and it goes right up to the top. And so it's most visible within your list. Kind of like the same way you can do with like email in the web version of Microsoft Outlook. You can take email and say, pin that. Bam. I don't want to forget about this guy. Okay. So that's really, really cool. But See, it was in this organization thing, not a, great, not a great argument because that's just not how it works, okay? All right, so then this falls into that whole idea of discovery, okay? So the idea of discovery is like a user needs to go find a team, right? And I, I'm thinking, do you really? <laughs> Okay, do you really need to go find a team, right? Like you like Lewis and Clark kind of going out and says, man, there's all these Microsoft teams out there. There's a thousand of them created in your organization and I need to go find the one that matters most to me. Okay, and this is where the imposter idea comes into play. Okay, now I'm gonna say maybe, maybe this matters to you, but I'm gonna guess also in a lot of cases based on your business, it doesn't. Because check this out, okay? A lot of teams are just named, like on the left, they're static teams. They represent a functional area of your organization, okay? You got a team called HR, that's for HR. IT for IT, marketing for marketing, engineering, blah, 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 right down the line, okay? And if you're a member of that functional area, you're a member of that team. That's awesome, okay? And, and so it's unlikely that you're not busy and you're looking for other teams that will get involved in Okay, to then find more work. That's probably not very true, right? That's probably not common, right? If you have a static Teams kind of environment. However, if you do use Teams for what I call dynamic work, okay, project based type of work, okay, then there's going to be use cases where there's two, usually two audiences for a project. You have people that are working on the project. Guess what? The workers of the project, they don't go looking for teams either. Usually 
somebody provisions the team and I'm a resource of it, they just add me to it. I never have to do the action of going, where is that team project five? Yes, five, nine, three, two, one. That's it, yeah, I got it. Okay, and then put, add myself to it. No, it is on usually the manager's responsibility to get me in to then access it. Still, I'm not discovering. I'm still not having to like go out and search and find these things. Okay, but there's other people that do have interactions with projects. Okay, these people are usually administrative staff. Okay, like for example, this is a good, this is actually a real life example I have here. Did, did work with this company, they build conveyor systems. Okay, so think of like a large distribution warehouse for like mail and sorting, like Amazon, Ikea, those kinds of things. Huge conveyor system, moving boxes here, I'll sort them, put them in trucks, and off they go. Wham! It's awesome. Okay, so every time they have a new deal it's a new project so they have a group of folks that design engineer get the proofs do blueprints and then install it that's a project they put it in microsoft teams they got all these channels man it's awesome however they have a whole series of support folks they're not part of the project therefore after it's been implemented customer calls up and says hey uh is this the conveyor system company yeah and um it stopped working can you come help us fix this or we like to reprogram it it's the after support folks, kind of like help desk. They need access to all the teams. They need access to all of the book of work, okay? See how that's very different? And I think maybe that case is pretty unique and may not fit, may not be you, where you actually need to discover teams. Those guys, those support guys, they need to look at them and discover them all the time. I have some ideas about to help them also, okay? So naming conventions, I need them, Brian, because we have all this discovery. I need to go find them. Really? Really? Really do you? I'm not so sure. So, but here's on the three, those are the three options I've thought about so far as the kind of rebuttals for teams self-service, dealing with naming conventions, dealing with like imposters, things can be disorganized, or you got discovery. Okay? All right, so that's pretty cool. Now, Ryan, how do we solve some of these issues? Okay, the issues that we solve this with is we use what's called the naming, actually, let me see here. I think I want, before I want to get into it, no, I'll go through all the, I'll go through all the, all the rebuttals. So that's the naming convention piece. The other major, other major item that people have about it, let's see, I want to see the, is Teams Sprawl, okay? This is where they say, hey, Ryan, there's just so many teams, I, I just don't know what to do with them. I don't know what to do with them. It's just, I'm really scared that I'm going to have so many teams in my environment that it's going to be really, really bad. And from a, if you're an IT person, this is your probably number one concern is that you can find this item, this idea of team sprawl, and it scares the living out of you. Okay. So here it is. So I've already kind of mentioned the whole idea. People really aren't, it's not common that people are going to do discovery. Most likely you're a member of teams and you get added automatically. You know, it's like on Christmas morning, people don't go along look around for parties to go to. They're kind of just automatically already a part of the parties and the environments, not needed, okay? The other option of this is the concern they have is, Ryan, if I'm looking for a team and there's so many, it's really hard to find that one team in the midst of a haystack. So this needle in the haystack can sense, okay? Now, the other concern that really kind of illustrate comes out of this is that what I call the junk drawer scenario, okay? As an IT person, they go, hey, Ryan, you got all those teams, you gotta manage them, okay? I need you to make sure that all the stuff, like the old ones get disposed of, the new ones are there, they're relevant, we have a nice and clean, tidy, awesome environment. Can you do this? I'm like, I got it, okay? But a lot of what IT folks are really concerned about is that managing teams is like managing your junk drawer at home. Think about your junk drawer. Your junk drawer is awesome, okay? It's got really important stuff, but you have actually forgotten what, how important it is or what the context is of this stuff. And as an IT person, they just look at all these teams, they go, I have, I have no idea about what is the business relevance of this team, right? And he has no idea whether to delete it, kill it, whatever. They have no context, right? All they know that this is a team, should it live, should it die, should we go away with it? I don't know, it's so horrible. It's like if you have a set of screws in your junk drawer and they're, there Ikea, there's the screws, but they were actually from two years ago from an Ikea cabinet set that you put together and they were, you just held onto them just in case something happened to that cabinet and you would need an extra screw. Like you have forgotten all that and yet you're still holding onto this feels valuable, but I don't just remember. 
right? So that's the biggest fear for IT folks is they got to manage all these teams and they're actually kind of held accountable to that, keeping a nice clean environment. It's kind of been the way of the IT, but I, I, I'm going to say, hmm, we got you. We have some options for you guys to help with these problems. Okay. So now those are kind of the wraps up my scenario of kind of like, here's all the issues kind of names are bad teams sprawl. There's so many. And it's funny. I was working with an organization and we're talking about this and they said, Ryan, I think they think, we think we have, we have about 1500 teams and we believe 40% of them can just go away. It means they're not used. All right. Well, how are you going to know that? How do you want to go about doing this? You want to go knock on doors? And they go, no, I go, I got you. So here we go. So let's start looking at how do we solve this problem? Okay. So the first, first tool we can use here is we use a naming convention. Okay. So Microsoft has got a great tool where you can put an automated naming convention onto the teams. Okay. So that means when someone goes and puts a new team, it'll then automatically put in some kind of components around the name. So for example, you can fill in what's called um, a prefix. Okay. And then also a suffix. And the group name here or the team name, that's the part the user filled out. So here how's, here's how it works. So Jim is in the department of retail. He creates a group called Team 4, and then it fills in GRP, Team 4 Retail. And the cool thing about the naming convention is that can actually fill in static values, okay? But it can also fill in dynamic values. So it can pull information from their user profile and is limited about seven to eight different attributes that are not augmentable. Okay. And those are what those are is what you get. Okay. So that's really powerful and very, very cool. All right. So I like that. And so really that's kind of the idea about the naming convention. So let me show it to you in action so you can see what this thing's all about. Let's do a little demo. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to go to a team's environment. Okay. To work on a naming convention, Okay, to, to configure it, it's kind of weird. You don't go to the Teams management area. You go to Azure Active Directory. And in here, you go to Azure AD. You go to the Groups area. Groups, there we go. And if you go into Groups, then you're gonna find this area here called General Expiration and then Naming Policy. So if I go to the Naming Policy, that's really where I'm looking to go. And you have two things here. You can fill in a list of blocked keywords. So these are like bad words, bad words, bad words, bad word, bad word in French, bad word in German, bad word in Spanish. Any of those bad words, you can make sure that they're not included within your team naming structure. That's awesome if you're working in an education scenario and you have junior hires and high schoolers provisioning teams. Okay. So then that's black words. Not really complicated, but that's the kind of cool thing you do. But then you got here in the group naming policy, and this is where you define it. Okay. So my current policy is listed right here. This is the letter P group name, then the user's department, and then the state and province they're actually in. So the way this is configured is you just each row represents a different piece of the puzzle here. So here's my prefix, here's my suffix at a string of static value, dash, at a dynamic value of department, but here's the list of available, available values that can be filled in for that static component. Hey, that's really cool, that's pretty awesome, all right? And so I got state and providence, and it goes to the town. That's how you make it. All right, now let's go see if it actually works, okay? So right now I'm logged in as an administrator. Okay, so something you need to know, and I'm gonna come back to this, Admins are immune to naming conventions when they provision teams. Mm, let's come back to that. Okay, so let me switch over profiles. Okay, so now I'm logged in here as Alex Wilbur. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for playing. Good to have you. So he's going to go over to the team's environment. Team, I'm just using the web here. And I'm going to go down to the classic create or join a team. Create a team. It's going to be the create build here. I'm going to build from a uh, template. I can build from scratch. Let's say it's going to be a private one. Sounds good. And look right there. It's actually showing me the naming convention. So let's say this is for project D. Dun, dun, dun. And it automatically shows me based on the naming policy that I'm in there. Hey, Alex is from the marketing department. He's in the state of California. So that's why CA comes into play. And that's pretty darn cool. Okay, so if I say create, it's now gonna provision a team with that particular name. That's awesome. And that's the naming policy, okay? So that's pretty, pretty cool.
pretty cool stuff there. I, I like that, and it's a it's a good feature unto itself. I'm gonna say skip and let that thing go. Here it is, right there. Now the question is, Ryan, can you can you edit this thing? Can you change the name after it's put into place? The answer is yes. You can change the name afterwards. Okay, but the underlying like mailbox has been provisioned. It's got that name. SharePoint site URL. It's got that name. Okay. Title stuff you can change around after the naming convention has been put into play. It doesn't enforce it afterwards, but it does keep it nice and tidy because we like the nice and tidy. All right. So there we go. That's, this is kind of the naming convention component. All right. And, and I imagine you guys are like, oh, that's really cool. I kind of like that. All right. So I'll talk to you guys about this, uh, some best practices here in just a second. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so the other issue that comes into mind here for this guy, okay, and these are kind of my kind of best practices, okay, for naming conventions, is the first thing I'm going to really ask you is if you're, if I'm working with you and we're kind of deciding, trying to set this up, I'm going to ask you, are you sure? Are you really sure that you're sure that you're sure you want a naming convention, okay? And um, I had an organization, we set up a naming convention for them. They lived with it for a couple of months. And then they just, just, I asked them, so how's that working for you? Okay, they said, I go, is there value to you in using this? And they said, no, take it off. It's in our way, okay? Because that's the kind of thing, the cool thing you want to do with this is you really want to run kind of the classic, like, hey, run a pilot, run a test, and then fail fast. If it's going to fail, fail quickly, right? And so that gives you that idea, okay, um, uh, you know, if this is going to be of real value to them. And the way they worked it is they had a naming convention, they had a prefix. They were using a prefix for to designate different types of teams, one for departments, one for cross-functional, one for general, and then one for projects. Okay. That's way, that's what it was. Okay. And I go, is that helpful? They go, no. And I go, and I, I go, I bet it's not because you can't sort them in the team's interface. You have to manually move these things around or pin them. So the sorting is what the original thought was, but they go, that's just not my common case. And they also discovered that they were in, they didn't do a lot of discovery, not as much discovery of teams. Like I need to go find the right team. They were just added to the right teams automatically. So the use of the naming convention actually um, was a drawback. Okay. Let me go back a slide. This right here is my actual team's environment. Okay. And here's a good example of a naming convention. Okay. And it's using a prefix DPT ad hoc clients. Okay. And so it's designed for organization, but it also makes it so I have to, I have to look at that first prefix before I get to the actual thing. And personally, what I find is I find the prefix is in the way. I'm like, I don't even think about the prefix. I think about, I'm looking for marketing. I'm looking for services. I'm looking for app dev. I'm looking for the keyword mash. I'm looking for these things, my brain, and maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just my unique perspective on it, but the name, these prefixes, I find are incredibly inhibiting my work here. And I actually have to think a lot harder about finding the right team than I really want to. Okay. So that is really interesting kind of an item. All right. So let me keep going. So number one, I'll ask you, are you sure is a good best practice? Are you sure that you're sure? Are you sure? Sure. Okay. Next thing I'll ask you is you should have, you have an opportunity Okay, if you do have a naming convention, you can have it so you have teams that have it and teams that don't, the haves and the have nots. This is one of my, my best advice I can give you. Okay, for your static teams, don't use a naming convention. Awesome. For your dynamic teams, ones that are based off a project, ones that would need some discovery on them that people are going to be looking for, those kinds of teams, projects, conveyor system guys, right? Why not have a naming convention? Like here is their naming convention. Their naming convention was, it's not all, all automatic, okay? It's manually put in, is they would put the name of the number of the customer, 789, and then the name of the project. And that maps exactly what they have in their ERP and their Salesforce system. So now, guys, throughout the entire organization, they have continuity with customer ID, project name, from a billing standpoint, to implementation, and then also on the back end of support and services. That's really cool. Naming convention here, but for the static teams, 
no need for naming convention because you're not going to be discovering a new department to go be a part of their private team or their public team, just not common, right? So then you have, you can then have these teams that don't have a naming convention. All right, now check this out. Now, how could you get this? Mm, remember, who's immune to naming conventions? Ah, I can hear it. I can hear it. You guys are such good students. It's admins, okay? That would be global admins. So those are the ones that you have provisioned by your global admin. Have them be created. There's a finite number of functional orgs areas within your environment, whether if you're a company of 500, 5,000, and even 20,000, there is probably a finite, all right? And you can have that as a ticketing service, like, hey, we have a new department, let's spin that up. It's like, it's not real time. And so the admins can provision these a part of the launch process. Everybody has their team, they're automatically added in and it has no naming convention. And in the names teams interface, very clean, very easy for you to read and see what's there. That's a great idea. However, but for anything that's gonna be created from a self-service standpoint, naming convention, put it on there, off you go, fantastic, okay? And in their case, they're using customer name, number, and they could feed in a couple of profile attributes of what department it's for. That's cool, so then we did have to do a discovery of teams. Now you can see, you can deal with the imposter problem. Will the real HR team stand up? Well, yeah, it has no naming convention, that tells me this is the real one. Anyone that has a naming convention put onto it, mm, we know you'd be the pasta. Okay, so that's how you can kind of have deal with the imposter problem. And then also you can deal with the duplicates and a little a bit of kind of that whole discovery component. All right, so that's a good suggestion. All right, the next little best practice I have for you guys is keep your naming conventions and names short. Like Danny DeVito, short guy, funny, good movie, Jumanji 2, check it out. Your kids will love it. Okay, so when your names get long, they're hard to read. Okay. And in the web version of Teams, you cannot change the sidebar to like expand to see the longer names. Also, if you have a very, if you have a prefix, that makes it also that much longer. So keep your names nice and short. But this also brings up another problem or concern. Let's say you do use the uh, naming convention feature from Azure Active Directory and it's feeding in like, a, like an attribute like, like a department or even a state. Let's say in AD though, the states are spelled out New York, Michigan, New Mexico, California, right? Those are really big words. They're pulling from your AD, bam, that's going in that name of every group that's out there. Also, if they, let's say the name of your department. People love really complicated department names. That's gonna go in the name of the team. It's gonna be huge. It's gonna be hard to decide, to kind of organize those things out there. So, depending, on what your Azure AD has been set up and what the values are, maybe you don't have abbreviations. Like I have an organization right now, they have like a parent company and they got child companies. Mama, babies, okay? And so every child company has like an official long name, but they don't deal with that. They have like a five digit code. Like Ryan, how cool would it be if we could have like the five digit code in the name of the team? I go, is it really cool? Convince me. They said, sure, here's how it goes. Ryan, every now and then we have one of these parent, these child companies, they get bought and we can give them away. And we need to, be able to take, give them all of their teams material. We need to, be able to take that, their, their whatever number of teams, let's say it's a hundred teams. I need to be able to migrate that into a new tenant for them. They go, that sounds really good. I go, how's that, how's that work in reality? And they go, it's horrible because I don't know what teams belong to that particular business unit. They go, if we had a five digit code in the name of every team, we could then search and find them. I go, now I'm convinced. Now I'm convinced, let's do this, okay? Okay, great, so where's that five digit code? Ryan, I go, is it, in, is, it in, is it the thing, is it the company field in your active Azure Active Directory? They go, no, it's not in there. I go, okay, then we're gonna have to have some kind of workaround or some kind of custom solution. We're not gonna use the out of the box naming convention piece. We're gonna have to have like a form they fill out or you can use a product like Valve's Teamwork 2.0, it's off the shelf and has like an ordering piece and people order the teams and it automatically provisions, but it gives you an opportunity to kind of fiddle with the name and customizing the naming convention if the naming conventions that you need don't fall within the standard out of the box scenario that Microsoft offers you. 
obvious kind of scenario for consultants, right? So that's what we're really investigating and looking at for them is, okay, can we add in these codes? It's mostly so one of these child companies, if they get diverged, boom, we can grab them and push them out there. The other cool thing about that scenario is I go, so who's, this, who's the naming convention really for? Is it for the users or for the admins? They go, it's for the admins. I go, awesome. Then here we go. Put it as a suffix. Don't put it as a prefix. Okay. Don't put it as a, put it as a suffix, not as a prefix. Because if you go searching in teams, okay, let me get out of my presentation. Let me open up my real teams environment. Okay. So if I go to join teams and you're the teams interface, you have this really cool search teams piece here. This search box is horrible. Hear me. It's horrible. Okay. So let's say I want to find all the teams that start with the letter P. Oh, wait, there are none. That's a liar. How about C? A whole lot because we have a prefix here called client. And this is not a wild carded search. You actually have to type in the official name of the team in order to, for it to find. If I want to find all the client teams for P, I'd have to type in something that looks like that. Uh, that's really, really sticky, okay? It's really bad. So this team's interface or search is horrible. However, if I go to like the admin panel, let's go find the admin panel. Where are you admin panel? Where here you go. I go to the admin area here for teams. Stay logged in. I go to manage teams. Okay, this search is the administrative experience. Okay, let's say I want to find this guy, people. Okay. Notice it was able to find it, even though the word was in the middle of the name of the team. So my advice is hey, if it's in, for administrators, use suffixes. Okay, if it's more for end users, yeah, use a prefix, but use one really short and you've got to really know that you're really doing that. Okay, because that's going to really mess up Jackup's people search experience through the team's interface. All right, it's just, I find myself having to, okay, I got to type five characters before I get to the actual thing I really want to type. So it's this always, I don't know, it's this, it's this scenario here. I don't know, when you're a kid, you say, can I use the bathroom? And then the teacher goes, I don't know, can you use the bathroom? And you're just like, listen, I just need to use the restroom. I do not need a lesson in grammar at this moment, okay? So that is just, I just need to get to the, do the thing I want. I don't have to type in all of this extra prefix stuff. So that is really kind of a, a thing. So if you are a good practice here is use your prefix, use a suffix for admin scenario, can I use the bathroom? No. Okay. Oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. All right. So that's, that's my next, my best practice for you is use suffixes when you can, especially for administrative scenarios. Okay. So then the last scenario I have for you guys is, or best practice is um, one way to alleviate the discovery of scenario, discovery of teams. Okay. Is that you might know this, or you may, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but Microsoft teams has, and I'm gonna get this little laser pointer thing. There we go. Okay. So Microsoft Team, when you have a team, and I think I just froze my screen. There we go. Microsoft Team, when you ever create a team, there when you upload a document, it actually stores the document in a SharePoint site behind the scenes that you don't see. Okay. And so but in the Microsoft Teams interface, you see the files, you see the chat, you see the meetings, you see the full richness of the, of the experience. Okay, but on the SharePoint side, you just see the files. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? But remember the scenario of the conveyor company. So what they have, they have a group of folks, they're gonna work on a project for like six months. They get, it in, they get the conveyor system implemented, but then there's the post support people that need to then look at all of the teams and be able to search, find, look at the files, and look at the artifacts that are there. They don't need the details of the chat, the meeting histories, the OneNotes, all of that stuff. It's just in the weeds. It's not needed. So here's what you can do. You can actually take, this takes a little work. It's not, not hard work, but it takes a little effort. It's not done for you automatically. Is you can take the SharePoint sites that are connected to these projects and then connect them together in a hub site. 
So then you can have like a, almost like a portal of all of the projects and all of their data in one place. And then the support people, they access that content through a SharePoint interface, but the guys that are actually in the trenches doing the work, they look at the same set of files in the Teams interface and it's the exact same files. Tell you what, let's see it in action, okay? So I set up a little scenario here for you on this. Here you go, I have, oh, here is my Teams environment. I've created project A, project B, project C, okay? And there they are, look at the loveliness. One, two, three, fantastic, three projects, okay? And I wanna have those three projects have a look at their SharePoint sites behind the scenes. So if I look at project A and I go look at its files, okay? And it'll say over here, as soon as it's done loaded, okay, open in SharePoint. So I can look at, this is test file one through five, okay? I'm just kind of setting the stage. So if I click that link, it's gonna open up the underlying or connected SharePoint site that manages and holds kind of like the behind the scenes vault that's storing those actual files. Hey, that's really cool, all right? So, but what I've done, here it is. I've created this thing called, a site called Project Central, and I've, and I've connected Project A, B, C, and D, and connected it all together. And so it says Project Central, this is a hub site, and then I made a little top navigation that allows the user to get to all the different Teams, pretty simple. Added a little web part, added a little search web part, and it pulls in all of the documents. So for example, if we look at test document four, I click on this guy, notice it takes me in the URL here to the site called Project A. That's cool. Okay, so, so a little bit of work, and I actually made this whole interface, okay? And I was able to take these SharePoint sites these teams are private. There's like maybe like three or four people that are in these. But then these sites, the SharePoint sites, I made public to the whole company, okay? And I can control it with permissions really granularly. And I open these up to the group of users that need to see them. It's a grant, therefore, granting them access to all the stuff without having to get to all the, all the details of the running project. That's really amazing and really, really cool. So if I were to take this a little st a step further, Okay, so if we look at like project C, okay, this is the general channel of the team. Let's upload a document here to the SharePoint interface. How about project schedule? Sounds good. There it is, project central, project schedule. Okay, but then if I go to the teams, scenario, teams environment, I should be able to actually go and look at that same team and see that exact same file. So here we go to project C, general, if I go to files, project schedule is right there. And it would have worked the other way around. Can I upload from SharePoint, from Teams and push it that way? Let's try it out. How about uh, contact list? That sounds good. Updates the contact list. It put it here. And where was that? Project C, general. Contact list. These are the exact same files. That's amazing. But we've now created two different needs and this really handles the discovery problem. Okay, Ryan, I need to go find in teams and find all these teams. You mean my, my support guys gotta go add themselves as a member of every single team every time they gotta answer a support ticket? No. How about we do it this way? They automatically have access, they just go there. And this can be very elaborate. This is kind of a, what I call rudimentary version, but then you can make more and more elaborate versions where the documents are actually sorted with metadata and tags by customer, by client, however you wanna organize that. Then that's just, we're just doing SharePoint expertise kind of thing, and that's really, really cool. Right, so that right there is one of the cool things you guys can do to kind of deal with the naming convention and team sprawl and the discoverability. Okay, let me keep marching on. All right, so now we get into now what I call life cycle management. I know I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna, we'll get to these last couple of things pretty good, okay? Life cycle management is what we're dealing with is now a team has born, it's active, and then 
it goes inactive, <laughs> okay? You don't wanna see, it's like it's stale or it has a, have a meaning or its purpose that's out there. So how do we get around, get around this? And the question is, you gotta answer this question, is how long do you wanna hold on to a team that's inactive? Kinda of cool, it's interesting, right? And Microsoft has a tool out there called group expiration. So you can actually put a timer that says, hey, if a team is inactive for a period of time, bam, let's kill that thing off, okay? You're like, whoa, ho, ho, what are you talking about? I'm talking about something that automatically purges your junk drawer if it's not been used within X time. The key for dealing with that anxiety I'm putting on you right now is controlling the X, how much time, right? How much time? How much time do you need the Ikea screws from the time you put it together? What is its relevance? Good question. The thing is you have to have it universally across the, across the pane. It's for all of the team. So now remember, inactivity deals with this. Like what are we actually talking about, Ryan? Inactivity. Inactivity, you're talking about this. It means that the SharePoint site has not been viewed, edited, download, moved, shared, or files have been touched within the SharePoint site that's associated to the team. Bam, not touched or X amount of time. That can be days, months, or years. Next, the Outlook group that's associated with this, no one's joined it, no one's read the right messages from it, no one's liked the message within the Outlook web client. Third bullet, no one's visited any of the channels. Nothing, okay? And in order to use this, you have to have Azure AD Premium for all the members of the team or the group. Those are your criteria, and then when he says active, that's what we're dealing with. Okay, now how does this actually work, okay? So the way this works is this. Team is born, it's active, and then it goes inactive, okay? So here in my scenario, I made the inactive time, the X value, two years. It means it sits for two years, none of that stuff's happened. Then here's what happens. In 30 days from expiration, the group owners get an email. Ding, ding, hey, hey buddy. You got this team out there. You sure you really want this thing? Ding, ding. You can renew it at any time. Anytime. Fine, you're busy, I got you. 15 days go past that. 15 days from the last email and 15 days from the deletion, second email goes out. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, buddy, you got a group, you got a team out here. Nobody's touched it in two years. Two years, two years, nobody's even read it, nothing. You, is this important? You can renew it right here in the email or in the team's interface, your choice. One day before the expiration, ding, 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 email out to the group owner. Hey buddy, you gonna use this, same narrative, awesome. But then you're like, well Ryan, what if the group doesn't have an owner? Gah! No problem, you can fill in a surrogate. Okay, so part of the configurations you set up, like who exactly gets notified, okay, when there is no group owners, right? But that should be also something you should maintain on a regular basis, not allowing groups to have non owners. This is a bad practice all into itself. So it can be routed to your help desk, can be routed to IT, they can decide, okay? Then at that point, if once it gets deleted, boom, it goes in the recycle bin. It sits in the recycle bin for 30 days, 3 0, which means now. Okay, it's gone. You're like, oh my goodness, where'd that go? Suddenly they realized like I, they really needed it. And then they can be always shuttled out of the recycle bin. And then, but at that point, after 30 days, that sucker's gone. And the only way to recover from there would be like a backup that you have of Azure Active Directory and your Office 365 environment, which doesn't come by default from Microsoft. You'd have to have a third party tool like Veeam and a client, a consultant firm kind of help you set that up. That would be us. So that's kind of, I know, same shameless plug. And so I, it, just, it is what it is. So, um, so that's the process. That's the process, okay, what you're looking at. The key here is the X. How long do you want to hold on to the inactivity? So I've set up in a demo environment here, like 30 days. 30 days. And the cool thing is you can set it for all of the teams. Some of the teams are none. So you can be really selective. Maybe it's just going to be the project teams. Maybe it's just going to be these teams. Okay, and right now the interface is very manual. You have to manually add them in. You can do it through PowerShell. So you could create a script with some logic and then fills in teams that automatically have a name convention. And then you're like, well, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's just everything, all right? That's usually the case. Then the cool thing that happens is this. This is what the interface looks like. You get emails that look like this. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, buddy, 
That's the Hey Buddy email. And actually in the Teams interface, you get this little triangle and you can actually renew the team right from your experience. That's way cool, all right? The other cool thing you have there is got a whole bunch of audit features within the Teams environment or actually the group environment. So you can search for, hey, which ones have been auto renewed? Which ones have been deleted? Which ones are, have been hard deleted? So you can kind of get evidence about what's going on and get a picture of how much the thing's actually being used. So I have this set up in my environment, I'm like hey, how many of the teams have actually been deleted? And I was actually able to go kind of say, well, here's the recycle bin, I got two in there. I found a log, these ones were deleted and I have ones that have been missing. Oh, they're missing because they haven't been used. They have been hard deleted out. So that is really awesome, okay? so. Um, actually, for a little demo, let's see, let's see a couple of these features. Just I take a real quick second and have a look at these. If I go to the groups area, we have the naming policy. You have this guy here called the expiration. This is where you set up the expiration. Custom, 30 days. Okay, if the email contact this group owners, these are the ones that applies. That's kind of cool. So if I go to deleted groups, these are the ones that have been deleted from my policy. No activity. Okay, and if I go to audit logs, I'm able to see what were the names on these guys. Uh, DD Marketing Oktoberfest. Okay, so if I go to the audit log, I can go over here to activity. And let's delete that out. Let's go with delete group. And DD Marketing Oktoberfest. So I like that. I like it that this audit tool gives me a lot of visibility and shows me evidence. I got stuff in the cycle bin, how'd it get there? Oh, this is when things got deleted. And so it gives me at least a visibility. Someone calls and says, Brian, I need that group back. Not a problem, I need that team back. We can get that for you. Okay, so when it comes to team sprawl, okay, there is, there's a whole bunch of cool things that go on here. Okay, the, the first thing is you, you can put a naming convention for discovery, that, that, that makes sense to me. But the big feature you can implement is then this expiration. Okay, it's from Microsoft. You can say after a period of time, we want to remove these groups that are inactive. And it's funny, I have a client that we just turned this on in, and these are the ones that we think 40% of our teams are going to get destroyed. We turned it on, and then a week later, they all got notifications. Okay, now the IT group got notified because they were the group, they want to get notified when there's no team owners. So there's about 25 teams that are inactive. They, they did it for two years, inactive for two years, and there's no group owners. And they're like, let them go, let them fly, okay? Burn them babies up, okay? And so, um, so that's, the, that's really cool. So now they're getting a much cleaner environment to, to find things, okay? So people can search, they have more clarity about what are real active teams, and they're not holding on to teams that long. The other concern or issue that comes into play here, and this is a much bigger topic, is you guys can put what's called records retention. Okay, so you can put like, well, Ryan, what if nobody touches the team, but I have a, a records policy that says this thing's gonna live for seven years because it's a tax record or a contract or a lease for an agreement. Those then have priority over the expiration and the team will then persist. That's really cool. So there's a whole lot of stuff there that hopefully that'll be my next webinar is dealing with the policy stuff. But at this point, I kind of want to open it up to questions and answer and kind of just, because there's a lot of stuff I just covered on a lot of ground. So. So you do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so first up, um, this is kind of a double question to people who have asked similar questions. Uh, it goes into how to avoid teams over creation and sprawl and the understanding of why would you allow users to create teams or groups since they will create them and abandon them? Who has to manage all these empty groups with no owners? Yeah, so these are like scripts you can go download from GitHub that finds all your teams that have no group owners. And even in the, the Teams admin panel, it'll tell you really quickly which teams don't have any owners. So I would just like have a zero tolerance for that. Number one, zero tolerance for no group owners. Okay. The second thing is then I'll put the expiration policy. So those groups then get abandoned. They get automatically cleaned up. You're like, look, the toys, the kids toys automatically get put away. I don't have to touch them. If I just let them sit there for a little bit longer. I'm good. Okay. So that's the, that's the key. The other issue is then if you don't do that, then you're going to have to start provisioning the teams and you're like, Whoa, don't want to be doing that either. 
So those would be my my answers. I, I think I've kind of that was kind of an overarching kind of question I'm trying to answer in this this webinar too. Okay, um, backing up to when you were sharing the SharePoint hub hub site. Yep. Can you back up the SharePoint hub site. Sure. Can, can you? Is the question can you? Yes. Can you? Certainly. Certainly. And then another question on the hub spot hub site. How did you create this hub? Yeah, so it's, it's actually really easy. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give you the kind of the high, the high level awesomeness of it. Okay, so I actually built it in 20 minutes before the webinar. Okay, so in the SharePoint Center, I probably shouldn't tell you that, but that's just what it is. And I went in here, maybe a little bit longer, and went into sites. I created a brand new site communication site right here okay give it a name looked awesome okay then um i called it project central right so it's around here somewhere right here project central and then i registered it as a hub site and then i provisioned a whole bunch of other project one a b and c and d and i took these guys and i associated them with this so if i go up to hub sorry if i go up to this heading here hub the mouse is not clicking where I want it to click. Still not clicking where I want it to click. That's fine. Okay. If I go to the hub menu, okay. Uh, you can sort and find all the ones that are there. And then that's how you can associate them together. The next step is then you have to set permissions. So then like, um, I don't know if I did this. If I log in as Alex, who's not a member of the teams. So if we look at his team's environment, project A, B, and C are not here. Okay but he can interact with the teams through Project Central. He's got access through the SharePoint side and he can come and access this stuff. So I had to set up permissions so hey, the support folks can then come and have access to the files. And it's pretty awesome. So that's the bare bones of it. And there's, there's a little more nuances here and there. Uh, I've been doing this for, I don't know, since a long time. <laughs> so, uh, kind of a lot of things I just don't think about anymore too. So, but that's it. And if you're interested in some guidelines on it, I'd love to sit down with you and kind of walk you through it. Okay. We've had a bunch more questions come in. So we'll try and get to as many of them as we possibly can. Yep. Um, but next up, if I turn on a naming policy, will it rename existing groups? Uh, no, it's only when they're born. So at instantiation, does it go and moves forward? So yeah, so getting, that's, that's how that works. So can you retroactively rename these? The answer is manually, you could, um, or some kind of really cool PowerShell script that does that. Okay, um, and then question, another question, um, but before I ask that, I do have a couple more polls that I'd like to launch real quick. Sure. Um, so as we're answering the next question, which is how can you search for teams without owners? If all of our friends on the webinar could answer the poll that we have up, yeah. what other topics would you like to see in future webinars? Um, feel free to let us know while Ryan goes through and answers our question. Thanks guys. Yep. Uh, so the question was, how can you search for teams that don't have owners? Yeah. So really straightforward. If you're a teams administrator, then you can go to the Teams Admin Center. It'll tell you right in the screen. I think I closed it. I did close it. Uh, it'll tell you like your list of teams, one of the columns is owners. So if I go to Teams here, Admin Center, And then you can look at them, but it's not sortable or filterable. It just shows you which ones are there. So there is a PowerShell script that's out there. I just found it yesterday. Um, this is, it'll just run and give you like a, an output of like, here is an Excel sheet of all the teams that don't have owners. Those are the guys you go, okay, step one, zero tolerance with that. Everybody's got to have an owner. If not, we're looking to kill them off. So if you're looking to kind of do a cleanup, that'd be pass number one I'd look at, okay? So if I go to manage teams here, Owners, it's got two. 
So my environment's pretty clean for the number of owners that it has. So I like that. Everything is placed in a place for everything. Okay. Next. We have two more questions, but only one more poll. Um, <laughs> yeah. so poll the final poll is launching right now. Um, and it's, did you like the content of today's webinar? But for Ryan, don't answer that, answer this. <laughs> if a team auto expires, does it permanently delete all associated documents, SharePoint updated or other? Uh, yeah, it sure does. So remember it, when it expires, it goes 30 days to the recycle bin. Then if it, no inter intervention happens between then, then goes to the after 30 days, bam, it's gone. All of its components go with it. That's the underlying um, mailbox, exchange mailbox goes with it. Um, that would be the Outlook group. That would be the Microsoft team, the SharePoint site, the workspaces, uh, be a part of our workspaces, everything that's associated will go with it. Okay. So that, that's the, that's kind of the key. And a lot of times that scares people and what they end up doing, we end up doing for them is we create like an archive site and here's a site collection. Um, if there's something in your team that you want to keep, but you allow, want the rest of the team to just go away, grab your stuff, put it in this archive. This is a SharePoint site, so therefore it's not gonna go away, right? And you kind of have like this permanent storage, your attic, your, your department's attic, you have your working space, then you can have your long-term storage stuff. And that'd be a really good place for to apply policies for like data retention, you know, contract tax things, those, those levels. Great question. Okay, uh, two more questions. Uh, first up, do you need special access to Azure? Um, depends on what, right? So you need access to the Azure Active Directory to deal with the name conventions and the expiration. Notice that I, I was not in the Teams, I was not in the Teams Admin Center. It's actually a Azure Active Directory Groups feature set that usually catches people like, "I've been looking and looking, I can't find it. It's nowhere in here. Microsoft's a liar." It's like, "Nah, you're just looking in the wrong spot. Just go over this way." They're like, okay, so that's how that goes. Okay, and last question. Can teams work effectively if you are not using Exchange? Uh, for your mail. That is a great question. Um, I think I'd have to know more. Like what are you, so if you're using Office 365, and you don't are not using ex the exchange part for your mail. You'd have to have at least active 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 Azure Active Directory as a minimum. Using Gmail G Suite. They have Gmail and G Suite. Now, those are like competing ideas. Um, probably if our if I'm being really honest, I would say abandon G Suite and and use Teams. Uh, or ab abandon Teams and use all of G Suite. So I think it's going to be a challenge to integrate those two things together. Okay, they're, but they're using on-prem AD and Azure AD as well. So some more details. Okay. okay, so at least you got some parts of the puzzle in there. I'd have to look, I have to look and see what that looks like. Usually it's a full bodied experience is one of my, my, you know, the 30 clients we've dealt with and implementing these different components in. Um, so how about yeah, something we can I would say probably something we could possibly follow up on, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, that looks like it is all the questions that we've had come in today. Um, now if these wonderful people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Yes, uh, they can. You can go old school email. Woo! I'm on Twitter. So I usually try to tweet once or twice a week, something like that. Uh, a tip, something about this stuff that I'm dealing with. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So that's a pretty easy way to get a hold of me. Um, I'm local to Michigan. I travel pretty often and do a lot of governance work for organizations for helping them just make these decisions. The implementation stuff is kind of easy, right? If you don't get, don't get me wrong, like, it's easy. It's somewhat on the easier side, but it's the like, ah. I don't know how to organize this stuff. And um, I, every two weeks I'm on a plane somewhere 
going to talk to organizations about how to set up Office 365. Should we use Teams in which way? Should we use Yammer? How will we use it? What are we gonna use Yammer for? What's SharePoint gonna look like? What's our SharePoint implementation? How do we do projects? What should we use Planner? Should we even use this thing to do? I, I don't know, right? So that's, that's a lot of the work that I'm doing late, lately and it's fun. So if that's kind of where you guys are at, I'd love to talk to you. Awesome. Well, again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you to our hosts, New Horizons Computer Learning Centers. We appreciate everybody's time and the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll talk. See you later. Bye-bye.